Dr. Pamela Peek. She's a powerhouse on so many levels from being an NIH researcher, a very compassionate physician, author, and marathon runner. Every interaction with her seems to be a peak experience. Would you give a warm welcome to Pamela Peek? Well, it worked. You showed up. Why? You think I'm going to talk to you about food and addiction, don't you? Well, you're right. There's no question about that. But there's a little bait and hook thing going on here, too. Because you see, what I'm going to tell you is that it's not just about food and addiction. It's about our addiction to toxic lifestyles, period. Food was just the bait. It always works. I've sold a lot of books because of that. <laughs> they read the title, they open it up, and there's the aha moment. So there you have it. I promise you that you will learn science about food and addiction. You'll also learn an extraordinary solution that's based upon epigenetics. But first, let's go back and look at the whole issue of reward. The only reason why you and I are having this conversation today is because of reward. Reward that's been going on for a long time in two categories, sex and food, not necessarily in that order. Now, 50 shades of gray aside, <laughs> sex is pretty much the same thing it's been for a long time. Food, not so much. Food's a mess. We used to have nice things like whole foods, green things, good things for you. Now we have science fair projects. <laughs> you read the side panel on a Twinkie. It looks like jet fuel. Always be worried when the food-like product does not melt in a thousand-degree oven. <laughs> so what we're going to do today is we're going to take an amazing journey through science and figure out, hmm, how can we look at this entire overarching addictive experience through the eyes of a cupcake? <laughs> Hand over the chocolate and nobody gets hurt. The Hunger Fix I wrote, and this was the first consumer book on food and addiction, a little blueprint for how to get out of this mess. I was very happy when my academic colleagues authored Food and Addiction, which was the first textbook of its kind. 66 chapters, 70 world-class scientists, all of whom affirmed what was going on. I was very happy when this happened. Needless to say, we have a plethora of other books, including Fat Chance by my wonderful colleague, Dr. Lustig, and Michael Moss, the Pulitzer Prize winner, who won his Pulitzer for looking at, in an investigative way, the meat industry. This time, he turned his attention to salt, sugar, and fat, only to find out that we, of course, are consuming more than 33 pounds of cheese a year, three times that which we ate in the 1970s, and at least 22 to 30 teaspoons of refined sugar on a daily basis. All of this should worry you. In addition, he talked about what happens in the food industry when they actually sit down and strategize how to be able to make a food or a beverage that you love. They actually call it the bliss point. I thought you'd love the bliss part. <laughs> so strategic. The bliss point costs millions and millions of dollars. It is defined as that place when you have just enough sugar, refined sugar, not too much, not too little. It's the bliss point. They use PET scans and functional MRIs of your brain, these are brain scans, to be able to find out just when your little reward center explodes with delight. <laughs> that is the bliss point. At the same time, he also tracked the genesis of things like Lunchables by a large food company. 
And these Lunchables are a little scary combination of some bologna, some bologna, and it also has some, hmm, buttery crackers and some cheese-like looking things. These are fed to our children, and they are currently a billion-dollar industry. Why? No one's got time anymore. Here, eat this. And then we have Mika Brzezinski and her new uh, title, Obsessed, a little story about her food addiction. And what's really interesting is she's also interviewed everyone from Governor Christie and on up. Um, and I didn't mean just wait either. Um, <laughs> bottom line is, people with food addiction come in every single size. A woman walked up to me after I had uh, launched my book, and she says, Dr. B, come over here. And she was this big, about a size four. And she says, all I eat all day long is cookie dough but just enough so I don't get fat. I was terrified. <laughs> but this is the kind of thing that's been going on for a long time. People just have their own little blueprints for all of this scary stuff. Well, celebrities are coming out too. Watch this video. It's not about being on a diet, because for me, I've I've tried every diet in the book, and I'm a binger, and I'm a food addict, so I do admit to having a sometimes not very healthy relationship with food. It's and it's be hard because you're around it all the time. Well, it's like being an alcoholic and working in a bar. It's really hard. So, did you hear what she said? It's like an alcoholic working in a bar. The woman is one of the top chefs on the Food Network. Can you imagine? You know, it's a little tough because it's wall-to-wall -wall cues. You'll hear more about that in a moment. But before that, let's really hit some science. One of my best new friends is an extraordinary woman, one of the most brilliant scientists in the world. She is Dr. Nora Volkol, who is the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse of the National Institutes of Health. She's also Leon Trotsky's great-granddaughter. Very interesting. But most importantly, she's a chocoholic, a self-avowed chocoholic. And she was, also, she was very fascinated with why she was a chocoholic. Why? Um, and so, as a great scientist, she decided, I'll devote some time to looking into this with brand new tools. And she's also a great spokesperson for it. Look at this video. If you can't stop eating, are you an addict? Just like someone hooked on heroin or cocaine? stay drug-free. Dr. Nora Volkov, head of the National the Institute Chelsea. on Drug Abuse, yeah. says you probably okay. are. Right. There may be a common element in the loss of control that occurs with drug addiction and in the loss of control that occurs with, with compulsive overeaters, which in a way is not surprising because our brain did not develop all of these uh, circuits for us to take drugs. It developed them to ensure that we did behaviors important for survival, like eating and sex. It's both. She talks about that in addition as a sidebar thing, but it's extremely important you heard what she just said. And she led the way with her research, and what I'm going to be showing you is mind-blowing, because it basically has quelled all of the controversy around this. Is it really, oh, come on, do you just need a little more willpower? Oh, for crying out loud, it's just a cupcake. You'd think it was heroin or something. <laughs> Cocaine? No, it's a cupcake. What's wrong with you? In susceptible individuals, we have a problem. I think it's no longer a cupcake. Not for everybody, but just for those people who have an issue. And we now have, thanks to our Yale University colleagues, a food addiction scale, much like we have for any other addiction. But we finally got it about two years ago, which is very exciting, because now we as scientists can actually measure what happens in people. We can survey them. We understand. So. Let's figure out what happened. There are two parts of the brain that are involved. The first one is the reward center in the brain. Let me tell you the way it was supposed to be. If I had a cupcake, it was an occasional treat. It was a wonderful thing. 
So if I had it, what happens in my brain? Dopamine, the neurotransmitter that helps me feel pleasure, bliss, reward is secreted. But I can't feel it unless it bonds with its receptor. That receptor is key. So here comes the dopamine, bam, right into the receptor. And then, whoa, I'm having a real good time with the cupcake. <laughs> That's the way it's supposed to be. Now, flash forward. It's not an occasional treat anymore. It's a 24-7 affair. I wake up in the morning, and it's the hyperpalatables. Those are the sugary, fatty, salty food combinations. I call them false fixes. They make you feel like, oh, I can eat it right now. Everything will be okay. It was a lie. Because the minute I ate it, huh, you know, like that menage a trois that keeps taking place in every single bedroom across America every single night. You know, you, Ben and Jerry. <laughs> you wake up and say, I can't believe it. Two men. I go, I've done this. And who wrote that USDA label? Really, are you serious? Four servings per pint? Honey, give me a bad day and a big tablespoon. <laughs> One serving, 900 calories. Yes. So what happens when 24-7 I'm getting this stimulation, uber stimulation? You have a bowl of fresh fruit, and then you've got ice cream. Who wins? Come on. You know what I'm talking about. Now, if you're opting for the ice cream all day or any of those hyperpalatables, the false fixes, nutritionally, what happens in the brain? I'll tell you what happens in the brain. The brain says, you're overstimulated. We're going into primal mode. You cannot survive if you have this level of stimulation. Ergo, what I'm going to do is take it away from you. How does it do that? Watch the next video. What happens is all your dopamine receptors are changed up. They're down-regulated. There they are. <gasps> They're disappearing. Bye. No dopamine receptors. Now you've got about three left. Here comes all the little dopamine coming out. It's got nowhere to bond. Guess what? Now the brain says, see, I did exactly what I was supposed to do. No more hyperstimulation for you, little lady. All right? Well, that's the, that's the good news. I'm not going to feel the uber stimulation. The bad news, the bad news is that now when I have my cupcake, I get one-tenth the pleasure. So in order to get the pleasure I thought I was supposed to get, I need another and another and another. And thus begins the addictive cycle. Now, when Dr. Volkel was studying all of this, she was using PET scans to track dopamine receptors, but she said to herself, hmm, I wonder if this is happening across the board. Lo and behold, she laid the golden egg with her team. And what she found was that across the board, regardless of addictive substance, the same thing was happening, and I will show you. This is the groundbreaking PET scan. This is incredible. First, we start with the normal. I believe there are three left on this planet. I don't know who these people are, but we keep using them again and again and again. I think we lock them in a little room and make sure they don't live because they can't be normal otherwise. Little science joke. Now, we, now, what we did with the normal was we made this person very happy and filled with reward. We showed them something they love, maybe a beautiful sunset. And what you see, see that orange? in the reward center on both sides. What you're actually looking at is a flood of dopamine bonding with its receptor, bonding. And that person is, Ooh, oh, feeling so good. This sunset, it's blissful. <laughs> We're loving it, okay? Now, we used a radionucleotide to be able to do this, one that basically bonds with the dopamine receptors. Look at the cocaine and obese. Now, that obese person was also a food addict. They were verified through the Yale scale. They are indistinguishable. You see almost no bonding. This person is cued to get pleasure. 
For the cocaine person, it might be just the mention of it. <gasps> Here it is. It's on its way, whatever the situation is. And for the obese person, again, it could be whatever kind of food substance that they feel that they are hooked on. But look what happens. Indistinguishable. Try to argue with me now. <laughs> food addiction is real. But let me ask you a question. Do you really think it's the consumption that's most rewarding? Well, Dr. Volkow and her team said, hmm, maybe not so much. So what they did was they compared consumption, using brain scans, with cueing, the anticipation, the anticipation. And what we found was this. That had nothing to do with the consumption. When you actually eat it, after a while, and this is true of all addiction across the board, what we actually find is that the consumption of whatever substance it is is no longer pleasurable. For that matter, the only reason why you do it is to end agony. What really gets you going is the cue. This is me in O'Hare Airport. I just decided to take a little picture of the wall of shame, excuse me, cues, and there they are. All you have to do is look at them. In the background, I could just hear Eric Clapton go, mm-hmm, yeah, that's about right. And it's just knowing that you've got that in your hand. But when you actually eat it, it's like, ugh. Why? Dopamine receptors. Yeah. Let's look at the second part of the brain. So the reward center has down-regulated, decreased dopamine receptors. What in the heck is happening with the smarty pants part of the brain? That's the prefrontal cortex. If you tap your forehead, right behind there. Be gentle. It's been a rough day. What's going on in there? Well, for the longest period of time, people were saying, for crying out loud, just use willpower. Come on, crank it up there. Well, guess what we found? That didn't work so much. Because we found by using specialized, again, brain scans, that by looking into the orbital frontal cortex and by activating it with that one normal control, here they are activated. They're happy. <gasps> I'm so alive. But what's happening with the cocaine abuser and as well all other addicts? Much less activation. It's actually damaged and impaired. So now if you have an issue, like food addiction, you get the double whammy. You have decreased dopamine receptors, as you can see in the blue part of the PET scan, and then in the next scan, you can see that they're much less activated. Ow. So this is basically paramount, you know, for you to understand, because now when you walk up to one of these people and say, oh, come on, an alcoholic, it's just a bottle of wine, get over it. It's just a cupcake, get over it? Hmm, that's like trying to run a marathon on two broken legs. You have impaired ability to be able to be mindful, to pay attention, to make the right decision, to rein in impulsivity. This is a tough one. We have to dig ourselves out of this. We have two parts of the brain. We now have proof of organic changes that take place in this entire addictive process. We also have clearly the psychological prodrome that accompanies this. So what's the answer? 